William Henry Hudson's epitaph reads, he loved birds and green places and the wind on the heath and saw brightness of the skirts of God. W.H. Hudson, 1841 to 1922, was born in Argentina, settled in England when 33, lived in Cornwall and Notting Hill, and when in London, visited his beloved Richmond Park. He was a renowned naturalist and ornithologist, was a founding member of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, a novelist, and an acclaimed and prolific natural history writer and commentator. He was respected by renowned writers, naturalists, journalists, many readers of his books, and nature lovers. Any similarities to a well-known naturalist sitting behind me are purely coincidental. <laughs> a hind in Richmond Park was his last work. And although much of the action in the book is not in Richmond Park, we've selected extracts that have the park at their center and illustrate Hudson's keen observational interest in wildlife. Occasionally, when in London, I visit Richmond Park to refresh myself with its woods and waters abounding in wildlife and its wide stretches of grass and bracken. It is the bird life that attracts me most, for it is a varied one, although so near the, to the metropolis, and there are here at least two of England's few remaining great birds, the great crested grebe and the heron. The mammals are of less account, but I have met here with at least two adventures with the red deer, which are worth recording. Stags are aloof and dignified, if not hostile in their manner, which prevents one becoming intimate with them. <laughs> when walking alone one on a misty October or November evening, I listen to their roaring and restrain my curiosity. A strange and formidable sound, is it a love chant or a battle cry? I give it up, and thinking of something easier to understand, quietly pursue my way to the exit. Now later, not impressed by the male of the species, Hudson recounts his observations of the red deer hind. Seeing a hind lying under an oak tree, chewing her cud, I drew quietly towards her and sat down at the roots of another tree about 20 yards behind her. She was not disturbed at my approach, and as soon as I had settled down, the suspended vigorous cud chewing was resumed, and her ears, which had risen up and then were thrown backwards, were directed forwards towards the wood about 200 yards away. I was directly behind her, so that with her head in a horizontal position and the large ears above the eyes, she could not see me at all. She was not concerned about me. She was wholly occupied with the wood and the sounds that came to her from it, which my less acute hearing failed to catch, although the wind blew from the wood, wood to us. Now, after sitting there for a space of 15 or 20 minutes, sufficiently entertained by watching all those minute motions I've described, it came into my head to try a little experiment, and I emitted a low whistle. Instantly, the ears, which had been pointed forward all the time, were thrown back. And I remained in that position, and they remained in that position for about a minute. Then, no further sound being given, they went forward again. Then the whistle was repeated, and the ears came back, and remained a longer interval, but finally went forward again. And the whistle and movement of the ears were repeated five or six times. And then came the surprise. When I whistled next time, one ear was laid back while the other continued pointing forward to the wood. It was as if the hind had said, for she no doubt knew the whistling came from me, I'm not going to be cheated out of my woodland sounds anymore. I shall keep on attending to them. At the same time, keep one ear on you to find out what this whistling means. The surprise was that she was able to do such a thing. I had not known that an animal with trumpet ears could use them in that way, receiving impressions from two sources, taken in and judged separately and simultaneously, as a bird receives sight impressions through his eyes placed, as in most birds, at the side of the head, each with its own distinct field of vision. Or as the chameleon, with eyes mounted on rods, is able to keep one eye on the movements of an insect in its neighborhood, while the other looks at you or some other object which attracts its attention. 
<laughs> I soon found that if I refused to whistle as long as an ear pointed back at me, it would at last go forward once more to assist the other. And when this happened and I then whistled again, the one ear, always the left ear, was instantly thrown back again, the other always keeping steadily on the wood. <laughs> this way. <laughs> What a way to spend an evening. <laughs> <laughs> However, this went on until the hind <laughs> this went on until the hind got up, shook the dust and dead leaves off, and slowly sauntered away without even a parting look at the person who had interfered with her pleasure by behaving in that eccentric manner. But she had taught me a lot. <laughs>